would like to introduce my co-chair, Mr. Jin Zhong. Я буду вести по-русски, и сейчас я бы хотел предложить. В нашу программу внесены изменения. Первые два доклада отсутствуют, и мы начнем программу с третьего доклада, а в конце, в конце той программы, которую вы имеете на руках, мы добавили два доклада. Доклад Виктора Лагутова и доклад двух молодых людей Озанкара и Артур. Is it okay? Okay. Итак, первый доклад Education through research like effective way for capacity building in space science and technica will be uh, give Andrei Kramlich, Samara University, Russia. Please. 15 minutes. Добрый день. Я буду свой доклад делать на русском языке, поэтому кому нужен перевод, приготовьтесь. Я Андрей Крамлих, доцент кафедры космических исследований. В своем докладе я хотел вас познакомить с образовательной технологией по подготовке специалистов в области ракетно-космической техники и всех вопросов, связанных с использованием космического пространства. Особенностью данной образовательной технологии является вовлечение, активное вовлечение учащихся в реальные проекты. По этому пути вовлечение студентов в выполнение реальных проектов идут все передовые университеты мира. И мы в своих образовательных программах пытаемся реализовать эту образовательную технологию применительно космической технике. На данном слайде вы видите образовательные технологии, которые реализуются на нашей кафедре. Кафедра ведет свою подготовку на базе двух институтов. Это институт ракетно-космической техники, на базе которого мы реализуем бакалаврскую программу «Малоразмерные космические аппараты и наноспутники», магистрскую программу по направлению ракетные комплексы и космонавтика. И начиная с 2018 года мы запустим новую магистрскую программу по направлению системы управления движением и навигацией». На, на базе Института математики, информатики и электроники, а именно на факультете, факультете электроники и приборостроения, мы реализуем магистрскую программу по направлению прикладные математика и физика. Эти образовательные программы реализуются на русском языке. Но несмотря на это, как показано на слайде, Среди учащ, учащихся, помимо граждан России, ну, естественно, граждан Казахстана для, и Белоруссии, для которых русский язык не является барьером, у нас много студентов из различных стран. Это и Южная Америка, Бразилия, есть представители Чада, Израиля и ряда других из Аргентины. После завершения бакалаврской программы э, наши выпускники могут продолжить обучение в магистратуре по двум указанным магистрским программам. После завершения магистратуры 
у наших выпускников, те, кто проявили в процессе обучения ну, способности и желания, могут продолжить свое обучение в аспирантуре. Подготовку мы ведем по двум направлениям. Помимо русскоязычных образовательных программ, мы ведем подготовку также в двух институтах по англоязычным программам, но это правда программы магистратуры. Бакалаврской программы на английском языке у нас нет. В первую очередь это англоязычные программы, которые действуют, связанные с GNSS технологиями, то есть использование глобальных навигационных спутниковых систем. И здесь мы как бы закрываем два направления, связанные с алгоритмами, то есть программно-алгоритмической частью, и все, что связано, ну, так сказать, с железом, то, что связано с проектированием навигационных приемников. Эти программы пользуются стабильным спросом среди иностранных студентов. Для проведения занятий привлекаются преподаватели с университетов, партнеров нашего университета. Ну, преимущественно это западные представители из стран Западной Европы. В 2018 году мы планируем к запуску англоязычный аналог нашей уже давно существующей магистрской программы по направлению ракетные комплексы и космонавтика. После завершения обучения в магистратуре для тех, кто ну, проявит желание, будет интересно дальше как бы повышать свой профессиональный уровень, мы предлагаем обучение в PHD докторантуре по представленным на слайде направлениям. Ну, в настоящее время по GNSS технологии у нас обучаются э, двое граждан Индии. Ну, подробно о GNSS программах, то есть подготовке в своем докладе сделает декан факультета электроники Илья Кудрявцев. Чтобы реализовать вот эту технологию проектного обучения, нужно выбрать объект, на котором вести обучение. Понятно, что большой космический аппарат или ракетоноситель – это, в общем-то, очень сложное, дорогостоящее изделие, и ни один университет, даже лидеры мирового как бы, рынка образовательного, не могут позволить себе. Но развитие микромеханики, микроэлектроники – позволило в общем университетам, которые ведут подготовку специалистов в области ракетно-космической техники, реализовать вот эту технологию проектного обучения, взяв в качестве объекта обучения наноспутник. Ну, наноспутник это маленький аппарат, но он имеет все атрибуты большого космического аппарата. Ну, на слайде представлена статистика запусков и то, что планируется, все это показывает о большом интересе к подобного рода аппаратам. И не только с точки зрения образовательного объекта, но также и как э, уже средство проведения исследований и решения серьезных задач. А среди ну, большого многообразия наноспутников широкое такое применение нашли наноспутники в формата Кубсат, то есть это кубик со стороной 10 на 10 и различные его сочетания. Среди этих спутников, как показано на слайде, наибольшую популярность имеют спутники э, в размера 3U, то есть трехюнитовый спутник, то есть спутник со стороной 10 на 10 на 30 сантиметров. Ну, этот размер он является ну, оптимальным, можно сказать, в некотором смысле, что в нем можно разместить все необходимые нам бортовые системы и их размер можно сделать, ну, они такого размера, когда их можно, в общем-то, сделать в университете. Реализация технологии проектного обучения подразумевает наличие материально-технической базы. И помимо традиционных уже компьютеров, то есть специального программного обеспечения, которое необходимо для проектирования. 
необходимо также наличие оборудования, которое позволит создавать спутники, тестировать, э, осуществлять контроль при запуске и ну, проводить различные э, эксперименты, связанные ну, в том числе и по спутниковой радионавигации. Ну, вот, Могу сказать, что в нашем университете существует уникальный центр по тестированию бортовых систем наноспутников. Его уникальность заключается в том, что этот центр позволяет реализовать полный цикл э, со проектирования, создания, тестирования наноспутников. Ни в одном университете России данного центра нет. Подобные центры есть только на предприятиях, которые занимаются созданием и эксплуатацией ракетно-космической техники. Подробно об этом центре будет сделан доклад э, Ивлевым Александром. Ну, он расскажет уже более детально про этот центр. Э, ну, если у кафедры нет своих проектов, то ни о каком проектном обучении речь вестись и не может. Наша кафедра имеет опыт реализации, ну, создания и реализации своих проектов. Кафедра ну, усилиями своих студентов и аспирантов ну, на кафедре была создана наноспутниковая платформа, получившая название САМСАТ, Самара Сателлай, то есть Самарский спутник. Сроки создания спутника – это ну, порядка двух лет. Это коррелируется со сроком обучения в магистратуре. То есть каждому магистранту, когда он приходит в университет, предоставляется возможность за два года сделать спутник. Ну, принять участие, по крайней мере, в работах по созданию наноспутника. Ну, вот при создании первого нашего спутника мы планировали пять задач. Часть этих задач мы успешно реализовали, часть мы не смогли реализовать по разным причинам. Ну и одна задача, она находится на стадии решения. Вот этот спутник Самса 218D, он создавался по, скажем так, технологиям, которые приняты в России, то есть по технологиям Роскосмоса. И наши студенты и аспиранты, которые работали над созданием данного спутника, прошли все этапы, которые проходит любой космический аппарат. То есть начиная с этапа технического задания, технических предложений, эскизный проект и так далее, включая все испытания, получение, что немаловажно, разрешительных документов на запуск и, в общем-то, эксплуатация. Второй наш спутник, который был создан на нашей кафедре, это Самсат Куби 50, спутник, который создавался в рамках международного проекта. И его отличием является то, что уже этот спутник проектировался по, скажем, правилам, по технологической цепочке, принятой в Европейском космическом агентстве. Она отличается от той технологической цепочки, принятой в России. И как бы те студенты, которые прошли, принимали участие в работе над этим спутником, они познакомились с новой для них как бы процедурой. Ну, подробно об этом проекте расскажет аспирант нашей кафедры Денис Давыдов. Проектное обучение, помимо как бы наличия своих штатных преподавателей, подразумевает также и различные формы обмена, которые включают в себя обмен не только студентами, но и преподавателями. На слайде представлены университеты, и с которыми у нас есть э, тесные контакты. Наши студенты ездят на практике, э, представители универс этих университетов приезжают к нам э, на краткосрочные стажировки. Э, и также мы 
плотно, тесно взаимодействуем с учреждениями Российской Академии Наук. Это Институт прикладной математики имени Келдыша, Институт космических исследований. Ну, на этом слайде показан ряд фотографий, в частности, это вот профессор Клаус Шиллинг из университета Вюрсбурга, Германия. Он является руководителем университетской команды, которая успешно занимается созданием и запусков наноспутников. Он был у нас в 2012 году и читал лекции для преподавателей и для ну, аспирантов и студентов старших курсов. На фотографиях здесь показаны наши ребята, которые, будучи студентами, проходили практику в техническом университете города Дельфта. Вот. И в компании ИСИС, которая является ну, лидером по производству бортовых систем. Могу сказать, что вот эти двое ребят, каждый из них, ну, пройдя стажировку, получив практические навыки, уже при реализации наших проектов наноспутников были лидерами своих команд. Ну, один из них, в частности, вот, Денис Аваряскин в 2016 году защитил кандидатскую диссертацию. То есть мы видим, что вот этот вот подход по проектному обучению, он дает свои плоды. Ну и в конце хотелось бы сказать пару слов о тех предложениях, которые мы имеем. Ну, помимо двухгодичных магистрских программ, мы предлагаем ну, как, к обсуждению одногодичные, скажем так, магистрские программы, которые будут направлены на формирование конкретных компетенций, которые ну, магистры или человек, имеющий диплом инженера, не мог получить в своем университете. Мы готовы реализовывать такие программы, формировать необходимые компетенции, но при этом, естественно, к потенциальному учащемуся предъявляются ряд требований. Поскольку ну, первый год магистратуры, он так или иначе включает какие-то ну, общие дисциплины, то мы их можем как бы перезачесть, а уже какие-то специальные знания мы будем уже давать в процессе второго года обучения и а, как бы работы над выпускной работой магистра. Спасибо за внимание. our own uh, space agency and actually there were some groups which uh, offered us some uh, package uh, project costs a uh, project based uh, trainings um, I would like to know if this project based trainings are um, co-shared in, in terms of cost or does it uh, are the cost basically on the requesting country And in terms of the, um, as regards to the degree program, are all foreign students paying? Are there any, in the light of Vision 2030, where all countries should have a capacity building, um, are there any foreign scholarships available, at least to a limited extent, for foreign students? В нашем университете подобных программ нет. Ну, или, по крайней мере, я о них не слышал. Если быть вкратце. Стипендиальных программ в нашем университете нет. Все иностранные студенты, есть две формы, как бы два канала, по которым поступает наш студент. Это межправительственные соглашения. И как бы, есть ряд программ, которые связаны, скажем, с гражданами бывшего Советского Союза, ряд государств, ну и те студенты, которые едут за свой счет, на, полностью на коммерческой основе. Каких-то программ ну, я не слышал.
Спасибо. The next speaker is uh, uh, from uh, is this one there? Nadi. Nadi uh, from Zaria Space University. Uh, his topic is uh, say bye to garage plants and uh, say hi to garage satellites. Future school and uh, needs Syria for space science technology capacity building in the 21st century. So, Nadi, you have the floor. Yeah, please. Okay, um, so many people asked me about the name of my presentation, so I'll just um, say very quickly. Uh, it's called Say Bye to Garage Bands, Say Hi to Garage Satellites. Uh, it's about uh, needs theory, which is a sociological theory and capacity building in space in the 21st century. Um, the garage bands movement was a, uh, a rock, a rock and roll movement from the United States that people made uh, music inside their family garages. So it wasn't something that they learned in school. It was something that they learned by themselves. Okay, so uh, you will understand uh, as the presentation goes why it's called this way. Thanks. So, let's oh, at the back. Okay. All right. So I will start um, explaining about the human needs theory. Uh, we'll just go very quickly. Um, so basically, it's a theory that says that we. Uh, first satisfy our needs, so it's food security. Then you have some kind of autonomy that's needed, autonomy of thought. And the third stage is agency capacity. So what is agency capacity? It's when you know that you have the means to get some ideas and if you put some effort on it, there is a slight chance that you might get what you wanted done. Um, of course, you have civil, political, and women's rights that are aligned with it, and it works towards uh, democratic societies. And um, the, the reason why I was connecting this theory to the space movement is because the author, Ian Goff, talks about how um, the, the needs theory can be assigned with uh, sustainable development and with other technologies to get people uh, more um, capacity building in the 21st century. So you will understand better as it goes. Um, well yeah, I said about it already. So it's about having a sustainability consciousness over the planet 
just because you know your your food security needs are taken care of and also of the next generations. Um, so we we consider Brazil a, a huge garage. Uh, why? Because for the first time now we have a telecoms satellite that will take internet to everywhere. So until very recently, people living in the Amazon forest, for instance, they had no access to the internet. Now we have uh, SGDC, which is a telecom satellite that's up there now taking um, internet to everybody and reducing the digital divide. So it's a very good thing. Um, and now we, we talk about music. Um, this is the, the satellites that are being produced by normal people everywhere, not really um, in, in a very connected way. Just because people know how to do it, they buy uh, internet kits from the internet and they build a satellite with it. So I have some examples here. Um, for instance, Itasat is a is a it's been uh, recently no it didn't work. It was going to go up with Falcon 9. Uh, Falcon 9 had a problem. So but it's it's going very soon. Uh 14B sat this one. Oh, sorry. Uh Okay. No. Uh, it's okay. So, for instance, this one um, is um, an homage to Santos Dumont, the first person to build an airplane. He was Brazilian. It's up there. And Serpents and Floripasat, which was done, this one here, by universities. And this one up there is done at universities as well. They're all um, working and connecting. Um, we have all this uh, young people that are doing, I'm, I'm not going to go um, <laughs> in all of the satellites, but what I will tell you is that uh, we, we have these programs that are trying to get universities and young people doing satellites. We even have um, a school, a secondary school that built a satellite. We had the first satellite built by secondary school children um, released um, in Jap uh, by Japanese astronauts in the, s the International Space Center. So yeah, it's, it's a big thing for us. We're also having a scientific consortium with NASA. It's called the GLOW program. Uh, so we get uh, people and especially students, small children, to get um, data collection about sustainability. It's mostly about the weather, but they can also get about the mosquitoes that cause yellow fever. So Brazil has just started this collaboration. You can see here the number of schools that uh, participate in the GLOW program per municipality, and Latin America has a big participation. Now, we also have um, a regional center for space science and technology um, <laughs> for education in the Caribbean. So we had a recent uh, a forum, our first forum for the Southern Hemisphere space technology applications. We had visitors from many places in the world, especially from China. We had a very big delegation. It was um, very good to exchange um, everything that we can learn about capacity building was a bit like this forum. And yeah, it's always uh, very nice. We get new ideas. Um, this is the most uh, up-to-date platform and the, mo the, m the most modern platform we're having in Brazil at this moment for space capacity. It's called E2T. It's, it stands for Space Education and Technology. So what we're doing now at the Brazilian Space Agency is just try to reunite everything we have from uh, secondary education. We're talking about 13, 14-year-olds um, building satellites up to 
postdocs and um, everything you can do from the state of the art. And uh, we're having new ideas at the moment. So, um, yeah, maybe it's, n it's nice that I understand that I explained to you why we're having all these ideas at the moment. In Brazil, if you want to work for the government, you take a national exam, you take a test. And uh, there was a test recently done in the government. We have now uh, 70 people working at this uh, agency from this um, national exam. So now we have uh, an agency with 140 people working there. So it doubled its size. And um, I am one of the people who took this test. And what we're doing is we have um, a policy department, a space policy department, and they put there all the people that were not engineers, like me. Uh, I'm a sociologist, so we have been there for a year thinking how we can unite um, space with what we need in Brazil. So I don't know if you know that, but education in Brazil can be very bad. Uh, it's sometimes hard to get public schools on the right track. There's a big divide between um, public schools and private schools, unfortunately. And now we're saying we are, we are at crossroads and that we need to better our education. We need to have more space, more technology. And we are trying to focus on what Finland is doing. Uh, Finland gets very good results in PISA uh, educational tests. And uh, there's this person called um, Mario Kilonen. Yeah, she's the secretary of department in Helsinki, of uh, education department. And uh, she's trying to connect um, political and basic needs to education. So basically what you do is you get children to think about real problems and how they would solve it, just because children are so creative. And um, so in Brazil, for instance, we have huge borders. We have huge agricultural production. So it's nice to get them to, to say, well, you know, what do you need? Do you need uh, better crops? Do you need smart cities? Um, what are the tendencies? And, and you get children to do it uh, more practically at school. Um, so this is the example I was telling you. It's called the Ubatubasat. Uh, this is a public school here. And these children, they, um, they built uh, the satellite that the, the Japanese uh, took up. So it's very nice, very, very nice. And uh, the three axes that we're trying to get change in education are applications, young people, and curricular innovation. So applications, is, like I said before, just trying to connect everything you need to education. So we have um, communications need. It's a huge country. We have uh, positioning needs. We have observation. We have the forests. We have huge um, crossroads uh, about nature that we have to decide what do we want uh, as a civilization in Brazil. Um, do we want uh, more access to space and try to have it made it sustainably? Or do we, we, we just want to have uh, worst crops? We know that uh, climate change is going to affect our um, crops seriously, and we have to do something about it, especially small farmers um, who cannot adapt and, and mitigate uh, climate change effects. So young people, uh, it's the second act. We're trying to get policy for young people. They're not really good policies for young people at the moment. Um, we are at crossroads. We are at, um, having some uh, issues at the moment in, in politics, but we'll get there. We have a small set culture, like I said before. We're trying to do some projects, some practical projects instead of theory. And the, th and the third X would be curricular innovation. So our big um, modern thing that uh, some countries have for many years is the, the, the space camps thing, um, which Russia was talking about yesterday. So um, in 13 days, 
we are going to inaugurate our first space campus. It's very exciting. It's by the beach. It's a very beautiful place. And um, of course, they're not only going to stay at the beach, they're also going to assemble and launch some can sets. Uh, it's very exciting. Some adolescents are going there. And uh, just to conclude, I, had, I tried to do everything in one sentence. I, um, capacity building in space in the 21st century happens through connecting human needs to space solutions in order to meet sustainability. Okay, thank you very much. So, any questions? I'm Rogel Sessa from the Philippines. I'm just curious because you mentioned that there's a disparity in the schools on in Brazil. How do you approach the problem of uh, this, this kind of problem when implementing space education programs? Uh, for example, there are schools who might not be capable of uh, or, or doesn't have access to internet or does, is not capable of doing more technologically advanced education training like CANSAT. How, how I'm just curious how do you do that? Um, well, we, um, I mentioned that uh, we have this director for a year, right? So we have many questions. We don't have the solutions yet. Um, this is a huge issue in Brazil. So there's a lot of money in Brazil, but there's a lot of inequality. So uh, this is pr th you probably assigned our biggest problem, and I, I don't have an answer. Um, what we try to do is, well, the Brazilian Space Agency is a government agency, so of course we try to direct everything uh, to public schools. Um, the private schools are not doing very good as well, so we have to have something for private schools as well. Um, but we always try to direct our efforts to public. Um, so there are some, some levels, and uh, we always try to do it, uh, we c w what we call affirmative policies. We s it's always trying to direct to the people that need the most. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so any other questions? If no, thank you, Nadi. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> so next. Next speaker is uh, Joji from uh, Kyoso Institute of Technology, Japan. His topic is uh, the birds paradigm of Q Tech. So, George, please. Uh, good morning. My name is George Maeda. Good morning. My, my name is George Maeda. Uh, I'm with Kyushu Institute of Technology, uh, which is a bit long, so it's abbreviated as QTech. Uh, I want to thank uh, UNUSA and Samara University for organizing this uh, wonderful workshop and giving a, ver a variety of countries an opportunity to make presentations. Uh, so I will talk about this bird's paradigm. So in this talk, uh, we're going to present uh, a new way uh, to create space engineers for non-spacefaring nations. Uh, this is in line with the, the, the efforts of the uh, United Nations to, to, to help uh, uh, non-spacefaring nations enter the space age. So uh, the, the critical question is, what's wrong with the old way? Uh, takes too much time, takes too much cash. It's not too effective because students rarely see the whole picture, only parts of it. Uh, there's too much theory and not enough hands-on lab work. And the students graduate w without really having the confidence to, to build uh, a satellite inside their home country. So th these are the issues that we want to 
rectify. And because of these problems, uh, a lot of non-spacefaring nations are deterred from taking the first critical step. Uh, through the various presentations, I, I, I can see that a lot of governments are actually indifferent to <laughs> entering the space age. So uh, we have to work on that. Oops. Maybe I pressed the wrong button. So uh, I introduced today the bird's paradigm. I'm going to cover these uh, eight points. There's no need to read, this, read these because I will go through each point. Uh, slide by slide. So number one, to uh, acquire this know-how to, to build satellites, um, they have to go through the whole process with their own hands and with minimal supervision. So it can be tough, blood, sweat, and tears, but uh, there is no shortcut to, to acquiring this know-how. Uh, my, my boss is Professor Mengu Cho, and he always says, you cannot learn how to build satellites by reading books. He says you have to get into the lab and get your hands dirty. So this is how they get their hands dirty. I mean, it's, uh, this is done in 24 months, so it's a pressure cooker, seven days a week. Um, there's a lot of overnight uh, experiments that have to be performed. So here, here's the essential process, design, breadboard, engineering model, flight model, and then finally uh, de deployment in space. So mainly the students are on their own. We have a weekly meeting. The project manager is also a student, not a member of staff. Uh, the first three months they, they work together to come up with a common design. So all satellites are built to this common design. And then they break up into national teams. And the time pressure is severe because there's no way to delay it. Uh, from the outset, we signed a contract with JAXA for, for a launch date. So everything has to conform to that launch date. The number, point number two, the duration of this whole thing is 24 months. And this is because that's how long it takes to get a master's degree in Japan. Almost anywhere you go in Japan, it's, it's 24 months. So again, we have to conform to, these, to this constraint. So this is the timeline for BIRDS-1. We start October 2015, 20 f add 24 months, and that's where we are now. So BIRDS-1 has wrapped up their agenda. So uh, now we're halfway through BIRDS-2. And the timeline is exactly the same with a one-year offset. Um, same timeline. Point number three. So we actively recruit for, uh, students from non-spacefaring nations in Asia, Africa, etc. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of work finding these students. Uh, these are the nations of birds one. Bangladesh, Nigeria, Mongolia, Ghana, and uh, j just to make it a big constellation, Japan also pitched in a satellite. These are the nations of birds too, Bhutan, Malaysia, Philippines, and this is the logo the students designed for themselves. So a, b a word about finding birds partners, there's no shor shortcuts. Um, we prefer universities over governments because universities tend to be more stable than governments. Uh, and also the smaller the organization, the faster it makes decisions. Uh, we find governments are, are, are slow. Uh, on the other hand, the smaller the organization, the less money it has. So th this is a, a trade-off that has to be dealt with. So we use all available communication tools, Skype, fax, email, telephone. Um, we use Skype quite a bit. And then we work with the United Nations, especially when dealing with developing nations. 
So also, I started a newsletter. I'll mention this later on. So these are the hurdles, but the good news is the market is large. Most nations have not done their first satellite, so it, it's a big market. Point number four, so we assign two or three students from the same nation to build that nation's first satellite, thereby creating substantial history and, and pride for that nation. Th this, is, this is how we get these countries motivated. Being number one is, 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 is very attractive to a lot of these students. That's, that's why they work so hard. So, um, and then when the news gets out, the local media goes berserk, like the case in Bangladesh. Uh, this is the Mongolian response. They sent the film crew to us and interviewed all the key players and then made a 30-minute a program that aired on evening news. So uh, point number five. So uh, several s assemble several nation teams per each 24-month uh, long birds project. So there's the design phase, which I mentioned already, and then the fabrication phase. So the design phase is, a f is collaborative. They work together. But the fabrication phase <laughs> gets a little bit competitive because they're all building the same thing in parallel, and it's a race against time. Uh, so when they're done, they hand carry their CubeSats to uh, the Scuba Space Center of JAXA. This is BIRDS-1. They, they loaded the CubeSats into the deployer themselves. JAXA engineers did not do that. Uh, these are QSL cards of BIRDS-1 countries. Uh, all the students are very proud of having made their first satellite for their, for their country. So point number six, we require the nations to bear all costs because my university is very small. We don't have this kind of money. So the cost structure is exactly 50 million Japanese yen. This covers the hardware and launch. And then we need two or three students to build a satellite. This is well below 25,000 US dollars per student per year. But this covers everything. And then we need a ground station. And uh, I always say this is a good project for local university students to undertake because it creates interest and awareness and perhaps some passion about space. So point number seven, we lower launch expenses by releasing them from the ISS. It must be the most economical way to la launch satellites at this point in time. So our experience is you should avoid free launches. <laughs> uh, if you get what you pay for. Uh, in principle, the, the first satellite is a proof of concept mission. Uh, so it doesn't have to stay up there very long. Uh, ISS orbit is only is under 500 kilometers up there, so it'll come down after one year. <coughs> and uh, deployment viewing provided by JAXA is a tremendous PR bonanza. Uh, JAXA makes it into a big deal. Uh, this is deployment of BIRDS-1. JAXA invited all the ambassadors residing in Tokyo to this event. Uh, major press conference conducted by JAXA. Um, they want to show that their portion of the ISS is contributing to uh, international goodwill and capacity building. <laughs> so the, l the final point, number eight. We initiate uh, the BIRGE projects <coughs> every 12 months. Uh, N plus one starts 12 months after N. Uh, so on the top line, we have BIRDS 1 just finished. BIRDS 2 is halfway done. Uh, BIRDS 3 just started. And now we're looking for BIRDS 4. Uh, we will definitely go up to BIRDS 5. 
and maybe six, seven, eight, but for now, I'm canvassing for number four. If you're interested in number four, please see me after uh, this session. Let her catch up. Uh, so, as summarized, the birds one, birds two, birds three countries. So, not all of them are doing their first satellite, but for most of them, it is their first satellite. And we find this very exciting because this is the way we get these nations to start their national space programs, to, to uh, <coughs> set up their space agency is what we would really like to see. <coughs> so this is the newsletter that I edit. Two objectives, inform stakeholders of what's going on. Uh, it's important to keep stakeholders happy. And it's also a useful marketing tool to, to, to tell prospective uh, countries what we have done and what we're doing and what, we'll, what we will be doing. Uh, this is very recent news. Birds One won the uh, 2017 GDC Airbus Diversity Award. It's a $10,000 award. This is a picture of Taiwo of Nigeria. He's the project manager of Birds One. He went to uh, <coughs> Toronto, Canada to, to compete and then ultimately took first place. So I conclude there and I thank you for your attention. Thanks, George. Very good time control. Thank you. Yeah. You're and you're uh, any questions? I can hear you. Uh, sir, thank you for your good presentation. <coughs> My question is, uh, when you create the teams for building satellites, I want to know who is leader of these teams. It is science or um, professor or specialist with good experience in this field for his teams. Okay, um, the team itself is small, only two or three persons, but then you have several teams per project. So the project requires a project manager, and that person is simply selected by Professor Cho. He just looks for the most appropriate person. So um, behind each team is the home country, the stakeholder. So the stakeholder tends to be the leader of each team. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's how things are working. Yes? Ah, the status of birds won. Well. Another question is, uh, is uh, yeah, they have a camera, but um, the patch antenna of Birds One is not working correctly right now, so we have to overcome this with uh, higher power transmission. So we're getting downlink. The beacons are working, but our uplink is not yet working. But um, we are still working on that problem. I I hope that answers your question. And once the uplink works, we'll get pictures from the, from the satellites. Yes, um, Mr. Uganda, please stand up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is very good. Um, I just wanted to know if you have some scholarships, because I saw they are saying you have to pay on what. Are there some scholarships for developing countries? Yes. Um, uh, QTEC works with UN USA to supervise the PNSD scholarship, uh, postgraduate 
uh, studies on na nanosatellite technology. This PNST has been running for five years already. We take in six students per year, so we've already done 30 students. So we, we find PNST to have been a very successful program. But the first, um, uh, first agreement was for five years. It's now up for a renewal. And so uh, in November, we'll find out if it will be renewed for a few more years. So this has been a major source of, of students for the BIRDS project. I, I don't say majority of the students, but a good chunk of our, of our BIRDS students have come to QTEC on a, on a PNST scholarship. Uh, I think PNST is a great accomplishment because to my knowledge, it's the only scholarship uh, offered by the United Nations by working with a university. Uh, for almost any field you can think of. So it's a, it's a unique scholarship. Uh, on, on the surface, it looks like a UN scholarship, but underneath it's actually funded by the government of Japan. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, again, I am from um, Bangladesh. Yeah. I am working with the government. Directly. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, in fact, no question, but a suggestion here. So far, I understand. Here, uh, we have uh, in a third world country like Bangladesh, we have a lot of brilliant uh, students who, ca uh, who cannot uh, go further for this type of study for financial support. Uh, for example, you see World Bank like organization, they provide scholarship for in, in various subjects. My suggestion is here, United Nations also can create such, such an or, uh, such, uh, can support in, in third world country like Bangladesh. Bangladesh well, okay, Australia. I can answer that. It's yeah, a good yeah. suggestion. Yeah. The problem is the United Nations will find a suitable entity to give that money, okay? The United Nations itself will, will never, never provide that money. So you have to find these entities out there. In the case I of am suggesting like World Bank. World Bank, they support, uh, the World Bank or co Commonwealth, they, they have a special program, scholarship program. United Nations also can uh, create su such, such a scholarship program. That is my suggestion. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you. I th th all right. So okay. uh, anyway, I think I should sit down now. Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> yeah. Next speaker, mm, Viktor Lagutov, Central European University, Hungary. Welcome. I think I will be talking in English. <laughs> so I could you can do your own translation. Yes, I can do my own translation, but as usual, I have 175 slides and, <laughs> I, <laughs> and I cannot do it myself. Yes, sure. I'll, but I will try to quickly click through them so it will be possible to do it quick. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank organizers, uh, organizers and uh, Samara University for organizing such a wonderful event. And uh, it's so great to see all of you here. And hopefully it will be a lot of uh, follow-ups and cooperations being built up on what we're doing is specifically in terms of uh, building capacity, capacity building. Right, so while that's uh, my quick title is about ECP project and Iron Earth. I don't know how many of you heard of this uh, initiative, how many of you heard of this global actual initiative and idea what is going on. I will try to say a few words about this through my presentations. Right, so, and uh, another thing I wanted to mention is another organization I am representing here would be Global University Partnership on Environment and, and Sustainability. I am, I am sure it's also quite relevant to what we're discussing here now. 
but first of all, how I'd like to start my presentation is just being a little bit of provocative, because it's quite important to be provocative to attract all of your attention, especially after our yesterday's <coughs> such a nice uh, dinner. And it's uh, not, sorry? A round of recommendations as well. So, and we need uh, all of our attention to focus and concentrate. So a little bit of being provocative, then I'll try to be constructive and practical, talking how we can work forward. Talking about being provocative uh, and talking about university, since we're here as a university, what is a uh, recent trend? Yes, what we are talking about here now, yes, it's very important. University should build up all those project-based activities, very important. Yet, global trend nowadays is, that's what people are talking about there, is about end of universities. So all those Coursera, all those new technologies, people believe that it might kill all the universities. And who knows, maybe it's, it's, we will know world how it is completely different. For instance, anyone know TED? And uh, TED talk number one is how schools skill creativity. So that's what people are talking about. Of course, it might be different schools. Of course, it might be different dimensions. What I'm trying to focus on now is application side, not development side of rockets. OK, that's a lot of uh, creativity, a lot of efforts to be done. but. In terms of applications, that would be completely different. Where we are now, it's I revolution. Everybody knows so many different technologies, so many different tools out there. And uh, yes, that's I use. And it's uh, out there information being collected day after day, hour after hour, being stored in all those huge it's Google data center. Terabyte after terabyte, petabyte after petabyte, and now the revolution is everywhere. We have all the data being collected and available on our fingertips and being supposed to be used by decision and policy makers. Yet, this is the Budapest Water Summit where I've been to, and I was happy to attend it, and um, all others. But I like this one uh, specifically because there was not a single booth on satellite imagery or even on JS. We're talking about all those technologies. We're developing all those wonderful, beautiful rockets. We know how to launch it, how to use it. Yet, those people out there, policy makers, decision makers, they have no idea what is out there. They don't know how to use it. And it's quite a problem and quite a big gap between practitioners and ICT developers and uh, rocket science based <coughs> technologies developers. And this gap should be bridged. Uh, partially, the problem here, and it's not only here, but it's the usual problem in science. It's all those parts are being siloed. So we are talking here, trying, even now, we are talking about sustainability and about uh, uh, building capacity for economic development, blah, 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 sustainable development. Yet, it's, uh, we're mostly talking about rocket science, ro space technologies, not <coughs> about application of those tools, how it's used there. Yet, it can be very frustrating, trust me. You know, I'm teaching a lot on this kind of uh, application side, talking a lot about policy makers, <coughs> decision makers, and I can tell it can be very frustrating. Even easy things, even showing people how to use Google Earth can be very frustrating to policy and decision makers. Because data is not knowledge, right? It's, it's not information. It should be transferred somehow. It should be translated to many people. Because you know, we know that technology is changing so quickly, so rapidly. And the pace of new and new and new technologies is quite changing. Also, policy and decision makers believe that it's not affordable. They might think that, OK, all those space technologies is rocket science, right? We don't have money for that. Yet, we know it's nowadays it's not true. We know nowadays that all the satellite imagery can be obtained for free. We know that even schools in secondary school can develop their own rocket, uh, and uh, not rocket, but sorry, but uh, satellite and launch it. <coughs> also, quite often, the problem is that there is no trust in policy and decision makers to the results of what we're getting there. Yeah, military applications, yes, but if we're talking about social economic development, sometimes we just don't trust all those things. And it's uh, span, and it's just talking about the uh, curricula. That's uh, curricula in uh, universities, as we know it, in the 1970s, right? Now, we have all those uh, 2000 new modern developments curricula, what it will be in 2020s, we really don't know all those kids who are now building uh, satellites. Who knows what they will be supposed to be doing later. So there are a lot of challenges <coughs> which we have to fight, we have to meet, and we have to deal with. 
And uh, one of the answers, trying to be constructive, one of the answers uh, for that was a kind of uh, idea launched in Abu Dhabi in 2010 with Iron Ore's process. That was a process uh, focused on access and use of available societal and environmental information. Using all the wealth of what we're doing here, what we're developing. And I was uh, involved in number and facilitating a number of global communities on education, water security, disaster mm -hmm. management. Uh, main idea here can be seen here, just it was uh, initiated and established in 2011. Uh, it's access to environmental data and information has never been more important indeed. Yeah. And all the people, stakeholders who were there, uh, consisted not only on developers but also on practitioners. We had a lot of uh, agencies representatives, we have a lot of government representatives as well. And all those people tried to sit together and discuss how we can do better in data-driven decision making. Uh, INR's mission was trying to build capacity across diverse knowledge communities to improve decision making for sustainable development. Basically what we're talking about here. Was declaration was adopted. It basically, it was, as I said, global process <laughs> with many stakeholders. It's one of our meeting uh, with UNAP represented. Uh, UNOSA wasn't there, sorry to say, Laurent. Uh, UNDP and many other organizations were present. So basically, the idea is that there are eight different uh, special initiatives. And you can see them here. It's ION. Biodiversity, ion disaster management, ion water security, ion education, etc., etc., etc. Five of them were topical: water security, that water security, as I was mentioned already, is disasters, community, oceans, and uh, three of them were foundational: access for all, talking about legal aspects, uh, education, and network of networks, talking about technical aspects. We use different uh, communication platforms, of course, uh, going and discussing it and bringing it up. And we had different summits. A lot of organizations were involved. Um, nowadays, a uh, new alliance was formed based on those stakeholders, uh, which consisted of World Resource Institute, Geo Secretariat, Group of Earth Observation Secretariat in Geneva, might have heard it, IGD, Environmental Agency of Abu Dhabi, and UNEP. Well, of course, as we know, just space technologies is one of the ICTs, and it was very important aspect, very important component of our work there. And the idea is, okay, of course, bridging the gap between one and another one. How we were trying to do that? Different uh, seed-funded projects were launched, and one of them is project which I'd like to represent now being practical. It's in-service ICT training for environmental professionals, ECP. Idea basically of the project is to use the university network to bridge that gap, to bring together developers and decision makers and policy makers. Um, of course, as I said, all those problems, all of those challenges, how we can face them, how we can meet them, what we can do about that. We try to do some kind of regular workshops or review of available technologies for decision makers. So they will not know how to create rocket uh, satellite. They would not know how to uh, do remote sensing analysis themselves, but at least they will be aware what is out there, what kind of information can be collected, what kind of project can be launched, how much it would cost. Uh, the idea was to bring and to run those courses, not by us, not by university, experts, but by those who are really sometimes uh, excel in all those technologies, by companies, by, by uh, research agencies. And that's uh, all the community of people who are trying to bring together. So we had Google, we had Esri, we had uh, NASA, we had uh, YESA, and uh, many other organizations. We had Joint Research Center, European Commission. And universities were used as hubs, because universities have all the big network of their graduates who can come together for a periodical review of what kind of technologies are available there. 
so that's idea of partnership and practice. I just placed some of uh, logos here of organizations involved. Uh, I don't see an also logo here, so it's, it's there. Uh, it was too good, you know. <laughs> right. And uh, one of the aspects of our work was developing the manual, showing actually online manual or repository of all the tools, how they can be used for a uh, specific topic. And in our case, it was water security. So we have developed big website, indicated all those application case studies. So if you'd like, you can go ahead and uh, check it online. And uh, there are different authors, uh, different technologies, different organizations involved. So if you'd like to use specific technology like JS and specific topic or area, you can do that and try to find your own. You try to find your areas of your interest or uh, technologies or case studies. Another big component, that's actually what I'd like even to offer for kind of cooperation even more for everyone here, is the uh, workshops or trainings which were conducted regularly every year, different locations, involving all those stakeholders. So here we have uh, United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Europe, Water Security, sorry, Water Security, Secretary for Water Convention, Google representatives, Ministry of Education and Environment in Hungary, ESRI people uh, given a presentation, it's uh, Jens from uh, German Aerospace Center. Well, I don't know if it's visible well enough or not, it's UNOSA being represented there as well. But basically, target group, as I mentioned, is policy decision makers. It's UNDP country offices, for instance, for Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Caucasus, Middle East. Uh, here, for instance, we have a uh, picture for Hungarian National Emergency Directorate. Well, Laurent, this joint research center, Alan Bellward, uh, head of uh, uh, remote sensing unit there, presenting all their products, what they're developing, first hands. Not going through university, not going through us, but first hands. So that's basically one of the ideas. So we can accumulate as universities, in sometimes social studies or humanitarian universities, accumulate all that knowledge and pass it to our students, how it's possible to apply. But we also feel this information is coming from developers themselves. Again, German Space Agency. And as an example, what we're talking about is charter. I, I'm sure that most of you know about charter. Uh, when you can get access, in case of disaster, you can get access to satellite imagery for free. Most of our uh, participants, target group, policy makers, decision makers, they're not aware of that. So they don't know in case of that, they, it's, they think it's very expensive to get satellite imagery. Yet it's, it's, we know it's possible to get it for free. That's kind of presentations we have. Not really going deep into how the things are done, what is behind it, but on application side. Right, this is Google at Parsons presenting their technology. Some <laughs> private companies also being represented like Motorola, Airbus. Uh, we have a lot of, still have a lot of hands-on sessions. Uh, so practitioners can see that it's not rocket science, sorry to say. Maybe it's blasphemy here to mention something like that. But it's uh, not rocket science nowadays to get access to satellite imagery and to run uh, all those kind of analysis. Right, and it's through that we develop our own curricula and try to incorporate it and pass to our students directly or as here. Uh, we had the video conferencing with UNOSA again and uh, Greed Arindal, representative there, and students in our room. So, uh, we are running a few more workshops next year and it will be just special technologies for uh, that's old uh, poster. Next year it will be for water management with cooperation with UNOSA. And uh, innovations in disaster management and disaster risk reduction in cooperation with UNDP Regional Hub. And again, it will be all our st usual stakeholders, Google, ESRI, Geo Secretariat, uh, GRC, Airbus joined actively our activities and many others. Uh, 
So that would be my presentation. Let's bridge the gap and let's try to see how we can cooperate on that. It will be a great pleasure to cooperate with you. Thanks. Questions, please. Questions, please. Sorry, uh, I saw some map. Can you go back to a certain map there? World map something? Sounds Your map. Okay. Yeah, I want to ask a question Charter. on the map. Charter? I think it was on this one? No? Go back. There was some white and black, if you remember. No, I think I've not seen. Okay, there was a map there, and it was showing some black spots and some white, uh, the whole the, uh, whole world map. I just wanted to know whether uh, it was talking about uh, uh, countries uh, that are, uh, are involved in the things you are doing under space and what and what. It was there, uh, uh, but I saw some just some little dark spot in the Africa. <laughs> on the side of uh, either West Africa, something like that. So I wanted to know whether you are cooperating with only two countries in uh, Africa, or uh, because you are looking at cooperation, and so I wanted to know whether you have a vision of cooperating with other countries also in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I. Sorry, we couldn't find the map you were talking about, but uh, I think I've got your question. We are uh, quite open for any kind of cooperation. There is not like rigid scheme, rigid framework, which we are following. In terms of uh, companies represent, being represented within the program, it's open. So any, com any company, any developer can come and present what they're doing. In terms of uh, target groups, it's also open because it's open call for interest. And it's called for, for applications. And that's those uh, workshops I was talking about. End of uh, December, uh, end of, well, January, end of January, will be deadline for people to apply. And anyone can apply and be accepted. And following uh, maybe some interest, because it was quite a few many times discussed about potential scholarships, we might have or might not have it depending on uh, our partners. So we don't have our own funding, but some partners can sponsor some participants if they have interest in specific groups. Specifically from Africa, GRC was interested with GRC. You should mention how many applied for last year's session. We had almost 100 applicants for Africa. Yeah. We just didn't have the funds to bring in even funds. We don't have the funds, we can't. But there is interest. 100 applicants from Africa alone. Yeah, I didn't want, I didn't want to mention it. That, is that, <laughs> <laughs> that was in you know, one of the workshops was in cooperation with UNOS, and UNOS promised to provide funding for participants from Africa. Yeah, <laughs> and recorded too, and uh, it didn't happen. But it it doesn't matter that it might not happen next year. Our other sponsors can find their interest and sponsor it. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> next speaker, Kara Ozan. Koch University Space Generation Advisory Council uh, from Turkey. Uh, the title of presentation is Future Mass Mission Demonstration with Gamification, Next Generation Workforce Development and Self-Knowledge Management for Space Education. Very long title. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will, uh, you know, increasing tools and uh, education, especially in online training and education, create some needs. So gamification would be a nice tool for uh, education. So it's connected with self-knowledge management. To make it more impressive, I will mention uh, about uh, our information on Mars and the astronauts. But first of all, I want to ask you two questions. 
if you stranded, stranded on the Mars, what would be three things you bring with you? Or if you were the first person to step on Mars, what would be the, your first sentences? So we can discuss it in the coffee breaks. <laughs> and, you know, the capacity building needs connected with the next generation workforce development, right? So we need some tools to uh, implement how to create better uh, future to space exploration. So we explore Earth to pre make precautions to natural disasters, to understand the chains on the Earth, and also the foresee the future of the Earth. So you know, this really nice gift I like. You know, <laughs> when, when you are in space, there is a fluid shift through your head, right? You know, it changes your body. Uh, your pressure on your head and the nerves on the optical nerves, you know, pressures you and you astronauts have lack of vision. And also the key thing is your blood pressure, uh, blood volume increases due to the calcium of the bones, shifts through your blood, and astronauts lose their blood, uh, uh, bone density, 1% in per month. It's exactly we lose on Earth this amount in one year. It's really serious. There are very popular experiments about ISS, co about combustion, 3D printing, plant growth, or some bacteria analysis to prevent diseases. These are all important for journey to Mars. You know, we are living in Earth dependent zone. We can communicate with astronauts, we can send cargo, we can um, transfer some food. But, you know, we know the gravity on Earth and uh, about the ISS. We know the effects, but we have no knowledge about Mars or the Moon. So, how we will exceed our independent zone, which would be the Mars. You know, Mars is 10 times, uh, 100 times thinner atmosphere, no magnetic fields, we all know, and va water evapor evaporates quickly. You know, if you use WhatsApp to communicate, the delay is six minutes. You know, if you use Skype, let's say, to send a voice, or you want to take a selfie and send your girlfriend, it takes up to 20 minutes. So currently, Chris, the rover has a 30 minutes delay with NASA. You know, this photo shows the importance of uh, thin atmosphere. In four days, you can see the yellow circle, the water, which means actually the dry ice uh, evaporates quickly. So does anyone doing skydiving here? No. On, due to the atmospheric drag force, we land on the Earth around 50 meters per second, which is uh, 0 0.15 Mach. But if you try on Mars, it would be 1.50. You exceed the speed of sun and you crashed. You know, that's the effect of the thin atmosphere. You know, all these require sustainability. Can we create uh, energy sources on Mars? Or adaptation, can we psychologically adapt on Mars or independent zone of the Earth? Again, the genetic variation of us or the plants or bacteria and the cost. You know, we, have, we need a lot of money to exceed our zone to explore Mars. Anyway, you know, why this is important? Because the, this figure shows the all missions performed to the Mars. The success rate is only the 40%. It's too low to perform a human uh, spaceflight to the Mars. Up to now, I just remind your, uh, renew your memories, but the thing is how we will increase our education or tools to uh, prevent the possible mission failures, which is starts with self-knowledge, which is examination of the accuracy of self-beliefs. It connects the social and the personality psychologies of us 
And the key thing is it reveals personal mistakes from every day life experiment. But you know, what's the connection between the career? You know, as a young people, as a student, it's important to create uh, capacity building, right? You know, in our career, we have some facts, which is learning phase, mental status, such as motivation in the job environment, or in early career, personal memories of the people really affects, and it's the driver of the decision making. Self-knowledge also creates self-enhancement and the concept, which is, uh, there is an experimental study actually performed for the students. You know, younger ages uh, influence socially, and also there is a case that, you know, undergrads accept the suggestions or advices from masters, or the higher high school students listen undergrads rather than P PhDs. These are the steps of the communication between young people and uh, effects comes from the self-knowledge management, which is a uh, psychological studies, you know. But how is connected with the gamification? Self-knowledge is okay. It's a psychological, you know, concept we should all be aware of. You know, gamification goes through the education and uh, workforce development which is an, as an application, I will mention some emission scenarios by using gamification, which you can um, imagine like a virtual reality, augmented reality, or using AI, and we can use scenarios to, um, for Mars mission concepts to increase the mission success or prevent, you know, uh, failures. This, the structure of the gamification, which is we have user, Let's see, I am the user. I might use some decision paths. For example, I'm going to Mars in the, that gamification scenario. How can I design a medicine or drug if I get sick during the six months? Or you can think about any other possible scenarios, plant growth or so on. The difference between the usual virtual reality, the gamification concept should have a feedback mechanism and also some metrics, which is um, measured by, let's say, uh, professors or coaches. It determines your decision type, uh, self-determination, teamwork abilities, and so on. That's why you can use as to for student, you can use uh, for the astronauts, and you can analyze their all the skills before performing the real mission. There are some cases I will just quickly go through because we uh, exceed our time, but you can use a Mars ascent vehicle test. I can test it or astronauts can test it before doing human uh, Mars landing. Or we can analyze weather conditions or the communication structure of the Mars with the Earth. Or we can use as a robotic missions or the bacteria or the plant growth on the surface of the Mars for in-situ resources uh, utilization purposes. Or we can also use as a education tool. There are some real simulations shows the surface of the Mars. So we can create 3D map of the Mars and we can um, uh, teach students or uh, children uh, how is the Mars really. You know, the next, ge next generation workforce is important in the fact that capacity building, which is a uh, approach of our group. Uh, it was in IAC conference in a, a young professional workshop. We can think about two functions, it's F and G is a mathematical functions. In academia, industry, and government has different types and different approaches. It results some aspects, individual aspe aspects, such as education or internship, common aspects, which is we all um, face with them, such as sociological, socioeconomical, or political, 
or workforce demand, the relation between our bosses and young professionals, which are, you know, starting from self-knowledge management by using tools such as online uh, learning tools, gamification, it directly affects the workforce development. So, but if you think about workforce development, you should, you know, approach it as a category which is has own drivers. It's just an example of uh, nano satellite market, but I want to point out that not the amount of the nano satellite, but the thing is, if you think that, you know, in 2013, due to the OECD report, there was uh, 900,000 people in the space industry, excluding universities and research institutes. If you think the nano satellite, it will be launched in six years, yeah, actually we already passed the th first three years, but you know, 2,500 nano satellite means if you have 20 people in each team, it means 50,000 young people, generally nano satellites, you know, uh, young people or students work for nano satellites, are coming up in the industry. It's a huge workforce. So that's why the education is important that we should. Um, take into consideration. You know, it's the last words is we all have our actually journey in our minds, which is the imagination. That's one of the good example of the dream comes to reality is the Jules Verne of the book. So, you know, if we think our pioneers and we are lucky than them because they didn't have the tools and internet that we have today. So when we create our feature, we are lucky. We can even reach information quicker than Einstein. We have iPhone. So, you know, that's why we should bridge over the younger and the older generations to come through. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And uh, you said nothing about the dangers of uh, uh, short wavelength cosmic radiation during flight from Earth to Mars and living on the Mars surface of Mars. Do you have some idea how we can protect living organisms? Against yeah, the against thing is, uh, I uh, thank you for the question. I didn't want to, to you know, um, explain all technical stuff of Mars. I just mentioned some, you know, uh, titles, the purpose was the uh, thinking about education or gamification way. But the thing is, yes, you are right, and it's kind of a technical response, to be honest. But in that tool, which we can uh, collect all data taken from the rovers and the current orbiters from the Mars, so we can implement that data in the gamification tool. That's why if you perform that experiment, you can use that data. And you can be aware of the real data in the tool. So it could be ni a nice approach. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, next short uh, presentation from Artur Thomas Jajandra, please. Five minutes. Good morning, everyone. So today I represent three organizations. One is Terastra, Samara University, and Space Generation Advisory Council. So there were some questions about studying in Samara University. As a student of Samara University, I would say that there are few scholarships available. Like, for example, I'm fully funded. And there are few students who are subsidized based on their performance. And the last one. Uh, is the people who pay, it's not very expensive. And living in Russia in Samara is not very, very expensive. So starting with this. So today my topic is space tourism. I wanted to tell thanks to my previous presenter. He, he spoke about Mars. So before saying, I want to speak about Terrestra, which is a young space exploration 
uh, startup in Samara, and it was started by a multicultural team. We all came together at Samara Summer Spy School, so thanks to Professor Igor Belokonov. And so, how are people excited? When they are directly or indirectly related to space. So, talking about space tourism, what we are going to do is to bring uh, 14 people to Moscow to do astronaut training for free, obviously, and one of the winner will have a make 29 or 31 stratosphere trip. So, why 2018 June is because it is in line with FIFA and also Unispace. So, so our final goal is to get to Mars. Before going to Mars, we have a lot of steps to do. So first one is to go to stratosphere, then into Leo, and then Moon, and beyond. So as I said, the 14 people will be selected on basis of a mobile gaming app. And this is the primary mission. And apart from that, we also gave secondary missions, such as about talking about climate change, how they are going to bring, and doing documentary on such things. So it's a simple video about the project. So the main motive of UNOSA was no one should be left behind. So what about the refugees? We were talking about 190 plus countries. What about the refugee? Are there any projects? So it's not only about refugees, but there are also political issues in bringing refugees. So we actually wanted UNOSA to help us to promote this project, not only for people from uh, non-spacefaring countries, but also to refugees. Thank you. It's not a question, but I think uh, what you asked us is to give you the chance to present so that uh, we can provide you feedback or suggestions. And I think that I, that's what I like to highlight, that, okay, he didn't have time. We kind of put him on the pressure here for doing it in five minutes. But uh, if there's any feedback, ideas, proposals to him and to his team, uh, then feel free to, to make those. So just keep asking, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We finalize our work. Uh, short uh, announcement, please. Yeah, just a short message. So please be sure to choose one of the two options for the today's social program at the registration desk. You just put your name on the list of under option one, going to some other space museum, or option two, going to guided tour at the university. Thank you. Next session will be start. Uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, to 12, to 12, 11.10, 11.10, 11.10, 11 yes, and uh, have a good break.